Of the drugs and the sex, but it's but it's working out fine. And it's a habit the kids. Oh, right. Yeah, we're yes. past the like explaining drugs and sex. Now well, they do both, and it's fine. You know, so 22, 21, 21. She's a junior at Tish, right? I know. Wow. Hey. I know, honey. Yeah, honey, it's right. <laughs> Can you call me about shirts to like? Oh yeah, look at that! Um, John just texted me. He said he's he his, a train broke down and he was stuck for thirty minutes in a tunnel and he's almost here. Does that mean we imitate him? I think so. He just texted you too. Okay, he got stuck. Uh, he got stuck in the tunnel for like half an hour because the train broke down. But he said, "Let's see, I'm what number, what number are you? I'm eight. What number are you? I'm eight. So I'm, I'm down the hall. What number are you? You're up here? Oh, okay. No, no. I, I'm number eight. If they're going down chronologically, I think I'm down the hall. Oh, okay. I'm going to just drop your clip. Would you rather be here? I think I, I was just hanging out with Mark. It doesn't matter. 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 See, the point of water or why the phone is going to be heard anywhere. We should move Michael Roth into the hall. So let's say <laughs> oh dear, Michael. Here we are. Of course, I didn't know Michael be such a long time. We went to college together. Really? Wow. No. Never gonna work again. Very long. So much younger. Well, we live a different kind of life. That would be. I like the way you did it. You went. It was very sound. I'm Mr. Burke. No, waiting on some. We're waiting on some. What are we talking about? What's our subject? Um, parallel fits, yes or no? Oh, that's, <laughs> well, I, can answer, I can answer that one in two words. Yes. <laughs> are, you, are you making a comment about my work? No, no, no. I'm saying yeah. yesterday was awful. DMB guys were what's the roof of the best sound in the world. It'll take another hour and go. Uh, uh, is Rafe is still in town? Is that correct? Do you know? Ken? Hi. Hi. Is Rafe in town? Of DMB? No. It's just Paul? Oh, I know Paul. This is so funny. Well, I, 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 I've had both Jane and Ken work on work on me, and, and it's kind of still a wreck. I know it's it's kind of like having an endodontist and a dentist on me. You know, it's it's pretty good. An endodontist? Not here. That's different than an exodontist. Oh. <laughs> 
How are your teeth, Dan? They're, they're in. They're in my mouth. Yeah? yeah? I got one big fake one right here. Uh, we're getting old, Michael. Yeah, I know. It, Let's talk it, about it, what drugs we take. Yeah, I know. Why do you want this open? Really? This is annoying. I hope they're taking this so that you can be blackmailed. <laughs> this, 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 this is this is what we actually do. Oh, that's good. We like that. That's really good. This is not your microphone. Yeah. Yeah, just sort of jury rig it. We're hold, holding one just. Not my sound. Do you want to uh, just. Okay. Oh, there you go. So, um, I would like to start because you are all very diverse in your backgrounds. Um, I will start with uh, when you're writing, coming from writing from dance and opera and rock and roll in some cases. Um, and like there are some things like Dan, uh, working with a puppeteer, uh, Dan Carlin and uh, Michael Roth with your internet opera, and, and just coming from these different aspects of composition, how that informs or impacts the way you design for Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theater, and actual specificity of theater composition. So, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. How about Dan? How about Dan? Kick it off, Dan. Uh, okay. Come on, big guy. <clears throat> well, I'd like to start by inverting the question first, and then invert the question back to the way you asked it. That one of my great joys of doing a lot of sound design, I've been able to work with people like Stephen Sondheim and Duncan Sheik, and I, I would never talk to these people about my own work while I was working with them. I would just really take in everything that Mr. Sondheim would have to say or anything that Duncan would have to say. And there's no question in my mind that after all these years of working on, doing sound design for all these wonderful projects, that my composing, except I'm feeding back, it, uh, got better from doing the sound design work with all these people. So now when I go from switch hats and do the composing thing first and then yell at the sound designer, who's usually me, <laughs> I usually, because I know so much about what it takes to satisfy the composer in these situations with like Sondheim and Duncan, I really, uh, it really makes me think very clearly before I go into a project about, okay, I want to compose this way, but at the same time, I'm also thinking, well, how will I make it sound as good as possible in the theater? So uh, I switch back and forth from the various hats as <clears throat> I'm doing whatever work I'm doing. Let's say if I'm working for, uh, for Mr. Sondheim, I'm thinking about, oh, well, he's the composer. How do I imagine I think he's going to want it to sound? And so when I'm doing my own work, I'm very conscious that as I'm writing, what do I need to do to make it sound as good as possible as entrance music for John Gumara? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, no, we're happy you're here. So uh, but does that answer your question? Um, I think so. That was also another question that I had because oh. some of you have worked with each other as sound designers and composers, um, and, the, and Michael Roth working with Randy Newman too. Well, I, I was going to say, you know, impacts my, my, you. Uh, although uh, you know, uh, Dan is a much, much more experienced and, and smarter sound designer than I am. But I music direct for, for Randy, and it's interesting what you said about about him because one of the one of the things I really learned from sitting with Randy Newman a lot is he's a really good songwriter. That is to say, the professional task of actually writing a song for this moment right now, I'm going to actually do that now. And he does it. And it's quite something to watch somebody with, that, with a really meticulous sense of craft approach that moment, whether it's for Disney or just for himself. And those are two different things, too, because he, wear, he clearly wears a Disney hat when he does that. So the influence that's had on me as a an occasional songwriter, more as a lyric setter occasionally, 
I'm not quite, I'm not by no means a lyricist he is, um, is that it, it actually kind of made me much more, much less self-conscious um, about my rock and roll chops. And they kind of now show up wherever they feel like showing up. So that, it's, it's kind of interesting how that's made me, I think, a more open-minded composer, just in terms of being honest about it. So that, that's a part of me, as opposed to a part of me that maybe I should academically ignore. And so that's, uh, uh, anyway, that made me answer that. What about when you worked with Philip Glass? Okay. How did... Actually, he was, he was wonderful to work with. Uh, uh, we were trying uh, uh, to work, uh, this was in 2003, Mary Zimmerman, and, uh, and he created, she created the libretto, and he, of course, did the music for Galileo Galilei, and then it went from the Goodman Theater to BAM to the Barbican. And one of the things that we were, we were you know, in talking with Philip, he's a very generous, lovely person, and, and very articulate, and we were standing up in the, the balcony at the Goodman Theater, which is pretty substantial. And I said to him, boy, you know, this I love this part of, of this opera. And because we're talking, we're trying to balance the sound of the room to really get all the instruments up and, and fit the fit the voice in the right spot. And, um, and he said, yes, and I'd love to hear it. So, so what was interesting, and he wasn't being sarcastic, he was being playful. Uh, what we were trying to do is just create the right balance of instruments and voice. And working with a composer like that, who really knows what he wants to hear, was so it was so generous and it was so kind of fun and funny. And he's got a million stories that he'll tell you about his early life uh, learning uh, how to write music. Uh, um, and, and I took away from that uh, just uh, uh, again, the, the the things that the things that you learn of how they write, how they compose, how their how their music is structured, uh, gives you a greater insight into storytelling uh, using music. Um, but also, as a sound designer, the greater appreciation, uh, our collaboration between composer sound designer, how you make that that connection. Great. Um, so I would like you all to speak to. Um, that collaboration you have with a director as you as composers. So that's your influence that you get from other composers. So now you're in the role of com composition and you're working with directors. So I have listed here a few things like, John, you're working with, with Michael Wilson. Like these are about long-term relationships. And um, uh, Dan with Dan Sullivan, Michael Roth with Das Macknoff, Mark with Jack O'Brien, and Milburn and Bodine with um, Greg Boyd or Kate Wariski. It's about, um, what that conversation turns into when you've had these long relationships with them as a composer and, um, and how you work with them in a symbiotic manner? Well, for one, I think the conversations get shorter. I mean, that's what sort of happens over time. And um, I, I feel like I've been very, very lucky because Jack is such an expansive uh, human being. And uh, our, our conversations are often him finding a word or a phrase, and I remember when we were doing uh, Henry IV at one point, he said, right, this transition from this scene to this scene, you are the smoky current of fate, be that. <laughs> and uh, it's like, okay, I get, and knowing his ear, and having spent time and done a few other shows with him before that, knowing just, and he would just start, we would start playing these games, and he, he, the, he learned to talk this way by getting really drunk with a lighting designer one night, and complaining that he couldn't talk to uh, lighting designers and sound designers, and then he just started spewing language, and the lighting designer said, this, right now, well, you're you know, three scotches in, but well, you're just <laughs> giving me cue words, giving me ideas, that, that is the best way to, to help me right now. I'll figure out the nuts and bolts. Give me your, you know, your bouquet tops, as Jack would say. And, um, and so things like that can come down to uh, you know, the, the idea of what an underscore should be, or, or how much of a story I need to tell going from scene to scene. Jack has always, and usually what we'll do is we'll do about a, a two to three hour session working our way through the play, and either one of us or his assistant will be typing nonstop. And I'll be taking notes in my script, but I'll also have almost a transcript of what he said. And then I can keep referring back to that. It's just like, uh, a, a way to jump start things at times, or to kick me off in the morning, you know, if I'm about to approach that that project. But certainly, it's a, it's it's always a, 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 
an electric process doing that with him. And in the, in, in, in the theater, he just expects that things can come fairly quickly, and the technology has certainly you know, allowed us to satisfy that uh, in a way we couldn't 15 years ago, 20 years ago, at least even in a, in, in a MIDI sketch, and then go and fill it later. That's another, that's a whole other part of the conversation. And, well, and I, I've found in, in the work that Michael and I have done, almost with all, with all of our directors, very much like you're talking about, that it's, and we were talking about language earlier and trying to find out an, a language for how we all work. One of the languages for other people is not the language of sound at all. It's not what, how we converse with one another. It's, a, it's about the emotional journey. It's about what, what, is the, what is the mood, where are we going from, where are we going to, what are the characters doing, you know, and how is that happening? We find to be way more valuable than, you know, I'd like it to be a snappy beat, you know. But that can be a value as well. But, uh, but it's about the journey. It's about what we're doing. And that it works whether we're doing sound design or whether we're composing our own music, right? We're still trying to t tell the story, trying to thread us from one scene to another. Yeah, it's true that you do you develop a shorthand with each director that you work with, and they re rely on you to be able to solve problems often without actually talking to you. So the challenge is to get them to continue a collaboration even after you've been working with someone for 20 years. But I also find that uh, my challenge as a composer with all these different directors is how do you serve all these different people who have different ideas about theater and you have to give them each something different, but you have to maintain some kind of singular identity as a composer. So that's, that's been a challenge, is how, you know, how, do you, how do you keep your own sort of singular voice while you have to satisfy all these different masters, I think that's, has been a challenge. That's, that's really do you all long. feel you have a singular voice as you, or you, when you approach each play I, I, or I piece, mean, it's different? Let me, let me try this, because I, I think that's really important, because when you ask me about my work with, with Des, and uh, you know how much more we'll be working together? I don't know because a lot, is certainly the sort of most intense work we did together was as a Stratford Festival, and he's no longer artistic director there. I mean, it's moved into another place, and that's the nature of the business. But what I will say, uh, and uh, some of this is anecdotal, but I was paid to be at virtually every rehearsal improvising with an improvising. <laughs> with whatever was there, meaning a piano, a keyboard, a computer, whatever, I, and a snare drum, you know, and sometimes with some help from some people. And he always um, had a sense, because we've known each other so long, of he'd say, well, just do something now, and I know you'll refine it into something better. So sometimes I would just play a note or two, and I would just kind of watch it. And he, there, he would never say, you know, well, that's not right because he knew I was kind of watching it and just kind of noodling. And so he, it, it, we were never in a situation where I suddenly got defensive. Whereas there are other directors, if you just kind of put a note in the room, they go, well, is that what you're gonna do? And you go, well, I, I, it'll maybe be better than that. The other thing that's really interesting which, about what John just said, and, and as you know, Toy from our talks together is, you know, you, you do get to a certain point where identity is an interesting question for a composer. What does your music sound like? And um, one of the things that I have to say that Des was always very respectful of, certainly in, in the more recent work, things like The Tempest at Stratford, was he, we were going to do something with the, um, what's, what's the big thing where they all sing? The uh, mask. Um, and I kind of wrote a thing very, very quickly. And he said, well, yeah, yeah, and it was, kind of fake, baroque something. And I don't really like writing that kind of shit. And he was the first one to say, that's fine, I guess we could do that, but, but you're basically saying we shouldn't do this. And I said, yeah. He said, we should just kind of come up with our own way that sounds less disingenuous. And now, it's not every director who's going to, again, know me well enough to know that being disingenuous is a, is a weird thing, you know, and, and having an identity. So that's just interesting, and, I, and anyway. There, there was a, a, a moment during, during one of the projects I'd done again with Jack that uh, I, I had written a piece for a transition, and you always, you know, I always write somewhat modularly in that I can deal with if it gets four seconds shorter or six seconds longer, it will still make some musical sense. <coughs> and I, uh, 
I saw the transition and I realized they were kind of holding a little bit for the phrase to finish. And I turned to Jack and I said, Jack, I can tighten this by like three or four seconds. And he said, no, no, no. He said, you wrote it because it made sense that way. And he said, let me try to come to you. And it was like one of those moments where I sort of went, wow, how often do you really get that? And it was just having a, a moment where a director was so sensitive to whatever impulse you had in terms of cre creating that moment, your identity for that moment. And stylistically, the identity, I think, often, I find it, even if it's stylistically different per director, it, it expresses itself in, in a harmonic language, in the turns I might take versus the turns someone else might take in terms of, of, of where the harmony going, where the melody leaps to, where something does like that, where, where there's my real house of stuff. And I think that's where you keep trying to find your own identity within a variety of styles that you go through. I think that... Um Michael and I worked together as a team and have since we were very young. And so I think that we each probably have our own voice, but we also have a collective voice. But one of the benefits of having the collaboration is neither one of us are thinking about our own voice when we approach something. And I don't know if that's necessarily good or, or bad, but it's just, it's each moment, you know, it's each piece. And, and we, what, what I think we're really pretty consistent about is finding a voice for that, for that piece, that it isn't just hodgepodge all over the place. But that, that, that we, you know, I, I heard an interview with Mike Nichols and he said something that I've been saying for years, that, that you know, you're working on something and, and, and you've been reading it and you're watching rehearsals and suddenly you, you get it, where you, you totally understand, oh, this is what we ought to be doing on this piece. And everything seems to flow much more quickly after that point. You're not forcing anything. You're not trying to ape somebody else's style. It's just, but, it, but it's peculiar. It's specific to the piece. And, I, and Michael and I grew up playing in bands together where we played all sorts of different kinds of music over the years. And I think that's one of the things that we both find attractive about theater. Someone was saying the other day, you get new bosses and you get to reinvent yourself as an artist every time you do a play. And it's true. I mean, we get to do wildly, wildly different things. But I suppose, as you're saying, Mark, there's certain idiosyncratic things that just keep turning up over and over again, whether we like them or not, it's right? It's a milbo turn. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, do you have anything to add to that? Or? Well, I think we all have our own voices, no matter what we do. Uh, that even though, you know, either you're doing a, a, a project that's based in uh, ancient Greece, or you're doing a project that's based in Germany in 1920, even though there are stylistic things that are obvious that make the music different, we still, somehow our own internal voice still comes through the work. And I know in terms of my relationship with Dan Sullivan, that he doesn't hire me for every single show he does. Because he, I, he, I have a particular voice, and I know that he hires me for the shows that he thinks, uh, you know, it's going to more, be more simpatico, my voice will be more simpatico with his vision of what the piece is going to be. But, I, but I, I think we all have our own voices and that's what's sort of fun in what we do is we get to use our voice and let it be some, we get to be chameleons within our voice when we do different kinds of projects that are different time periods, different places and, and, and that's one of the really fun things about what we get to do. So, Rob and Michael, since you brought it up, do you both compose on the same pieces? Do you do you have to work and you're, you're I'm going to take this, I'm going to take that, or how do you work together as composers? Well, uh, I played guitar and have for many years, and in the band, I played the guitar, sang. Rob played keyboards, sang. Uh, we wrote 99% of the music that we performed. So now it's kind of great because uh, you know the studio that we work in now is so much smaller, right? It's a laptop and a mini piano with a bunch of plugins, and, and but I still use an acoustic guitar to write with, and Rob sits at the piano, and uh, you know we may have been talking about the play, we may have already met with the director. Uh, so, you know, I think if we all do this is that you get a melody in your head and you sing it into your phone because you'll forget it in 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and, then you, and then you come to the session and you, uh, we talk a little bit about 
you know, what we want to, what, how we want to approach the play, the tone of it. We don't always know the instrumentation. What we know is we have some ideas. Um, and, and this is often after the process of, of if we've met with the director, then building a cue list, a very specific cue list that, that uses the language of the director for these specific moments. Uh, you know, I think this should be a dark, twisted uh, um, uh, uh, cello. They, they may just say that. So you put that in your cue list, and then when you get to that moment, you say, okay, well, this is the inspiration. But you don't always literalize it. You try to just say, great, what's the moment? Who's the character? And as we're writing, Rob will work on the piano moments, often the melody, but I'll take it, and then we'll just uh, go from there. By, by having that back and forth, we're not clustered over the piano in a forehand moment. And depending on what the project is, uh, and it becomes pretty clear to us very early, if it seems to be, uh, and not all our projects are guitar-based by any stretch of the imagination, but if, if it feels like a guitar-based thing, I might say to Bodine, that, hey, why don't you work on like 15 licks and we'll meet tomorrow and see what you came up with. Because he's, he's so fast and it's so immediate to him and it's so, and then, and then we'll take them and we'll rework them and we'll turn them into melodies. We'll, it'll become a whole, a whole thing. But sometimes just a man and his guitar sitting alone is the best inspiration, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to uh, speak now to the scope and scale of what we do. Um, and, uh, and I know uh, this came out of talking to Mark about the differences of um, when you did Coast of Utopia trili trilogy versus a, a score and sound design for an Iliad. Like, and the idea of how you approach something large and epic versus how you approach something that's a little bit more intimate or singular in, in voice, um, and um, just the methods of that. I'm gonna toss that out first, uh, yeah. a few others. <laughs> um, well, I guess I can say that uh, I did a score, uh, when I do a score at the, Shakespeare in the Park, for instance, at the Delacorte, you have a, often have a larger, at least for recording budget than you would at a, at a regional theater. So uh, you know, I'll look to expand the uh, the score to a number of, of musicians that are going to play on it and sort of jump off from there. So um, you know, often I'll try to find musicians who inspire me who might fit within the concept of the score, and and, and from there sort of build out and, like, and add more musicians. Um, but it's 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 an ongoing challenge because we frankly we don't have the resources to do large scale scores most often. And, uh, and, we're, and we're, I think, increasingly having to find ways of doing things with a lot less, which is partly because we also can do so much with what we have, the little we have. Um, but the, the, the difference, I guess, in large-scale score, where suddenly you're talking about you have to be music contractor, you have to be orchestrator, you, or you hire one, and it just becomes a much larger operation than if you're just writing music for a show yourself. And, it, of course, it takes a lot more time. Um, but it's ultimately the result is so much more satisfying the more people that are involved and the more people you can bring together to realize some larger vision when you have the resources. And is the approach the same? Uh, well, generally, the, you know, the approach is you're, 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 you're telling a story. You have to interpret some uh, director's concept for a production into a certain vocabulary and then sell them on the, uh, on the vocabulary that you've decided on. Um, and, and often the way to do that in a large scale production is to do demos and try to try to show them what you're going to do before you spend all this money. Um, yeah, the, but one of the large challenges was uh, on an alien, which was a single double bass, was convincing the writer and the actor, it was a solo show, convincing them that a live instrument was a valuable thing to try. And, uh, we, uh, there was a lot of pushback at first, and, and it was, luckily it was a director I like, worked with many times before and said, well, let's give it a shot. And then, and that was the case where it was, about finding the right musician, finding a really gifted new music double bass player, bringing him into the room, start throwing him uh, through some, some delays of his own that he would control, and really kind of create a palette of his work from everything from knocks and gets to melodies and stuff like that, but, but allowing him to be in the room, and again, like I've been saying, all the time, and which required me being in the room all the time, and that was part of it. To follow up with that, when you communicating with this musician, we 
sheet music or what was the vocabulary that you used? What, 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 what I find is, uh, is exciting to, to do often do is I'll get together with a musician maybe a week before and we'll play. And we'll just kind of, I'll, have, I'll come in with some written ideas, I'll also, and we'll that will springboard us into other things and then I'll start to Right, and then we'll, so, it, so it becomes a very free-flowing process, but it definitely involved being with that person for a while ahead, and that was part of it, which is very different from working on you know, the, some of those larger scale things with multi instruments and, that, and all of that. Well, one of the things that uh, that we found working, you know, we just worked with the cellist and a, and a, and a harp player on a on a show at Steppenwolf, and uh, they were they were terrific, and they they were new music people. They they, they had a lot of experience in different things. But it was it was vital that everything was written down, and it was very important for them. Even though they had a very collaborative nature, even though they they, they even made some additions here and there to things, but they needed they desperately needed to notate everything, which you know we've gotten used to over the years with, with a lot of musicians that we've been working with. We came from you know being in a band where you'd look at somebody and go, hey, how about doing this? And, you know, you just go, 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 go. Uh, that's not always the case with, you know, particularly classically, classically trained uh, musicians. And, and even they, they were new music people, so they knew how to improvise, like nobody's business. But they didn't, they didn't know in the context of theater. It was really interesting. You know, this, we all find this, finding a musician that knows how to be in the theater live, knows the rehearsal schedule, knows that the director is kind of boss, and, uh, knows how to, how to come up with something if they need to in the spur of the moment. That language, there's a lot of musicians that, you know, they don't understand it, they don't want, you know, because it's a, it's a whole different, it's a whole different way of expressing yourself musically and telling the story. Uh, so, so finding those people was, was also a huge challenge. I mean, we were very fortunate to find two really talented people. And it's also part of our job to also make those people like a safe room. Because they're not used to being in those rooms, and it falls to us to sort of say, "No, we know this animal, and guide them." And over the weeks, it's, it's lovely to watch them get more and more comfortable with the process, and then to let them fly. Hugely important. I, I guess what I would add is, uh, uh, first of all, I really, really love great musicians, and and it, it's like one of the true joys of my life when I have a great cellist in a recording session. It's it's the best because the thing about a musician's ego at on that level that spoils me is that they're, they are really about trying to make your music sound right. And they'll say, let me do another take because that eighth note, I could do that better. And when you, and, and, and you know, they're LA sight readers, so you know, they're really slick at that. And, and it's really, it's really inspiring. I mean, so I, I love really great musicians and, um, the other thing I, I would just say about, um, I think this is just worth mentioning about working in a place like Strat Stratford, which spoiled me a little bit too, because it's just not the case other places, is that the contract for the musicians of Stratford, which has been developed over many, many years, is based on the system that had been sort of, because Stratford was founded by Tyrone Guthrie, which is England way back when, where there was live music and Stratford had live music for a long time. So the AFM contract you're given is basically, you're given these many musicians per show. If you need more, you're probably not going to get them, but you need to sort of anticipate that. Because they are paid not only for the recording session, but they're paid per performance a certain amount. And if, they're, if they are a, a person who plays every reed instrument ever invented, um, boy, are they making a lot of money. Um, that, that, and that pool also includes me, piano player, conductor, synthesizer player, etc. So it's, it's, it's just interesting what that contract does. But the musicians there anyway were first class and it was, the sessions were great. The, the thing I'd say about, about live musicians, it's also interesting because I, I love having live musicians there. And it's, everything you said, Mark, was, was right, that, that you want to have when, when I, this is a while ago when I did the Persians downtown, uh, it was, I guess 2003, um, the Iraq war was just this thing that was just happening. Um, uh, and 
I said I'd really like to do it with two contemporary music percussion players, and we found them, and um, and they'd never done anything quite like this. And first of all, to explain to um, Tony Randall, rest in peace at the time, that what actually, no, it wasn't two guys with trap sets. It was actually two guys who were going to have metal plates and various tam-tams and a whole lot of stuff we could kind of build a set piece around them. And, and then to find, to see the actors sort of get used to what this vocabulary, which I know you, we've all used that vocabulary in theater, but it's not something that's real common for a lot of audience people. They, they don't go to new music concerts and see people banging on cans, so to speak. So, so it's just interesting to see actors get used to that and, and an audience that doesn't always see it or appreciate it. So. Okay. Um, so this is leading into another yet job that we are usually assumed into is the role of the musical director. And um, how often is it, do you feel that that is an assumption that is made, or a choice that is made, or is it contracted? We're going to go into work practices now. Mm -hmm. um, is that a contracted thing, or how do you work that negotiation? Well, Michael has some very specific ideas about, <laughs> about this, which are, which are fantastic, and, and through AFM. I, I wish I remembered them. The rest, <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll hear about all these a, a yeah. lot. <laughs> yes. and, as, as time goes on, because those of us that are, you know, USA 29 guys, um, you know, we don't get those kinds of protections, and we haven't given it that kind of thought, but that's something this organization can really do. But, but, but I would say this is that if it's not, if it's not a musical, and, and when theaters, producers think of musicals, they think of something very specific, and generally a play with music they don't consider to be a musical, is that they, they I think they, all assume, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, that if we write something, we're going to teach it. They assume it. That, 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 I, I, I think in general, that's the assumption. It's only if I raise a stink about it, because maybe this is getting a little big, so to speak, that it gets to be something to talk about, or get somebody else to help, or something. Yeah, I, I mean, I usually just tell people right up front, I'm not a music director. I'm going to write these songs for you, and I'll you know I'll do what I can with the actors. But really, th this is the person you want to hire. And I have music directors that I work with that I bring in. That's great to work on on uh, when I'm writing songs. Or you do it right at the get go, like that's the yeah. I mean, it's if, if it's if it's clear that there's that kind of work to be yeah. done, I'll say you know it, this is uh, you know we're we're all better off if we bring another person in, and this is and and then they're they're hired on a, on a day rate, and I'm usually there when they're there. But we can all work together to try to make it happen. But I'm not a music director and I don't have, I don't have those skills. I know that some of you have those skills that I don't. But uh, Well, even if we have the skills, we often don't get credited right. for it or paid right. for right. it. Right. But the, other, the other issue I've been having is that uh, as I've been in, in session work, is that some theaters assume that I'm not going to be paid for my work as a musician or as a leader of the session. And that's something I've been fighting for lately is that if, I, you know, if I'm going to be leading a session, an, an 802 session, I need to be paid as a leader for that session because I'm doing that work. And I've had theaters say, you can't, you know, that, we just assume that's coming out of your compensation fee. And I said, no, you know, you can't. That, that's a fight that I've you know, been having the last couple of years, which I guess is similar. What about Dan? You write, but, what about you, me? I mean, you've written, you've written all sorts of different kinds of things over the years, not just, have you ever been in a situation where uh, it was expected of you to be the music director when it was really inappropriate? Uh, expected, uh, not really, I mean, I, I, if the music is complicated enough and I'm not comfortable enough being the conductor for it, I will go to the producer and say, we need to hire somebody. I mean, I, I've actually gotten to the point where I will start up front and say, we will need to hire a music director, or I will make sure I write for an instrument where an instrumentalist can be the music director, be it a piano or a violinist or an accordion player. Uh, but, but I prefer, uh, when writing incidental music that I know is going to be recorded, I prefer being in the recording studio, in the booth, listening to what's being put down on digital information. Uh, and. Um, so, and that's where I, my preferred role is to be when I'm dealing with my own music and not to be in the room conducting. I, I really want to be 
listening to what's actually people are going to be hearing in the room. So I, I'm usually up front and I say to the producers that there, there needs to be a music director. And, I, and I, I, I haven't had too much difficulty with that. What I, what I find often scores, uh, or scores can tend to be a combination of both sampled and live together, as well as just one or the other. And uh, what I've found is helpful is at what I do, and I often do try to do the same thing John, which is list myself as uh, keyboard slash music director on it. I'll, I'll tend to music director a fair amount. But uh, it also allows, and all of the samples, if, if, the, if the union decides to look at what I've done, I've said, no, that's actually been covered. In other words, my 20 lines of sampled instruments that are in there are covered on me as a keyboardist. And that has tended on a couple of occasions to kind of make things easier on, uh, on some of the larger scale projects. So it's, it's served a, actually a, a, a useful purpose in terms of doing it kind of by hoil. But the book, which, and the book keeps changing, which makes it confusing. Right. So even backing up even further then, um, the two roles, two fees. And how often are you struggling to achieve that in the respect, let alone the actual fee itself? Or do you think that's changing or getting better? Or well, it's something, I mean, it's clearly something that, that we need to work on. I mean, the, his, the history of this, and we talked about this a lot yesterday, is, is there a... This is my week, okay. Uh, you know, when, when did it happen that it was presumed that, that we were doing both things? And we're not exactly sure how it happened or when it happened, but it's happened, right? And it's happened probably to everybody in this room. I don't know if that's so true, by the way. Oh. Uh, 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 go ahead. I mean, I find that it doesn't happen at all for me. I mean, uh, but the, I understand that it does happen for people. I, I've been asked, uh, there's one theater company in New York uh, within the past years who said, oh yes, we want you to do both and there's just one fee. And I just said, no, uh, no thank you, I'm not gonna take the job. Um, and I actually think that's important for all of us to be doing that. I know maybe you can't afford doing it, but, uh, and I completely understand that issue. But it, in my mind, and I always say this to producers, it is no different than the set designer who does costumes. It's no different. I mean, they're two, two completely different skill sets. Um, and, and just the same way that the color of the sets is going to interact with the colors of the costumes that the same person is designing, there is that same relationship of what you're doing as, as a composer is going to intersect somehow with the way the sound design works. But they are two completely different skill sets. And, um, and I, I mean, I'm finding at most of the regional theaters that I've been working at, and certainly on Broadway, is that there's never been an issue. No. There's one time there has been an issue, is a reuse issue, where I did a show in New York where there was a composing fee and there was a sound design fee, and then it went to a theater on the West Coast and they wanted to repay me my sound design fee, but they just wanted a licensing for, for the music. So I told my agent, I said, mm, that, that's all very good, I understand. I know they don't have a lot of money, or they actually have money, but I, they don't want to do this. So I'm happy to be the sound designer, but you don't have the right to use my music. It became a big fight, but they didn't use my music. And so I found music. It was fine, but I, it, was, it was more about making the point that you can't, the value of the music that you compose has enormous value. And to think that the sound design has more value than the music that you compose, in my mind, is crazy. It's, that doesn't mean that, it, it, I'm sure you've all run against it where it's a problem, but, but it's, it seems to be getting easier these days to actually get a separate composition fee. I mean, we always get one now. But now, now that um, people are, are actually more stringent in preserving their music rights, that you, you can't just go and use any piece of music anymore in, in any production. And it was for years, people didn't care about that. But now, you know, they, they, uh, these producers risk 
an awful lot if they, if they don't. Uh, so I think as original composers, we have something to offer that, you know, and they understand the value of it more than they did. I, I think a lot of times how the fight becomes, or, 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 or what the, the problem that I get confronted with now is how to uh, evaluate composition fee in relation to the sound design fee if it is one person doing both jobs. And um, I will sit here and say, same, same, same concepts. What do you do though if it's a, if it's a really tiny score? Like sometimes you have. I will, I will sometimes like, make certain allowances about that when I know per like poundage. That's the other thing about the, the composer side of it. Yeah, that's if you're, crazy. If you're tops and tails of two acts. Right. It's different than you're doing a five act Shakespeare. Yeah, but you know, and but a costume designer does not get paid less to do a show with two actors. Well, they, they, they do on Broadway. There's different scales, but generally in, in regional theater, you're right. There's not a there's not a distinction that's made. And, and John, it's really difficult, especially when you're in a relationship, like Michael and I have a relationship, say, with Steppenwolf Theater that go, that's ongoing, is to, you know, to, say, to say to them, well, there's, there's literally 30 seconds of music we're doing in this show. Right. Uh, are we going to ask this theater that we love and that we're collaborators with to right, right. pay a full fee? And um, it, it's, it's always interesting. And Michael and I have actually come to a place where we take the full fee and then if we get to the end of a project and we feel like we want to give it back, we actually do. We'll give back a certain percentage, which, you know, flabbergast production managers. But, but they, you do know, you they get love. more work because of that? What's that? Do you get more work because of that? I don't, I actually don't. Then stop it. I, <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 there's also this perception, and this is what we all run against, is that is that, yeah, sets and costumes, two fees, two independent jobs, two skill sets. And when they look at us, they say, well, you know, we're only paying the lighting designer this much. We don't want to pay you more than the lighting designer. If you're one person doing two jobs, right? You follow this, right? So that, so that they say, so therefore, you will be, even though you're doing two jobs, you will now be making twice as much as the lighting designer. And we can't have that. And so part of our job is to go to every regional theater that we've worked at that doesn't have a budget and say, look, this has got to be your path now. You have to have a strategy to get from this point to this point. So you don't go in and you don't, we don't always just punish Stephen Wolf or something and say, you know, we're not going to do this. But we have done that, Dan. We, but, have, we, you, we, have, we have actually said, no, we, we can't do it. For when you use the word punish, why do you pick that word? I'm sorry. It's a, it, this is the perception. Because I'm, I'm, I'm this serious the, about that. This is the perception on the producing side. They feel that uh, we're greedy, we're needy. And, well. And, 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 uh, uh, but this is the good conversation to have because this is how, this is how they perceive it. <laughs> and what we're trying to do is be, I think it was David Budrys who said, you know, it's, it's generosity that we're also trying to exhibit in this, in this effort to bring this play to the stage. And so what we're trying to say to them is, okay, you don't have it this year. Can you right. get this much? And, and I think we've all been in that conversation. Because we don't want to, we want to see the, the theater succeed. We want to see the play succeed. So I'm not saying this happens every time, because every, every play is an individual negotiation. There's not a boilerplate for it. But isn't that in and of itself a problem? Yes. Yes. And that's where composition is like the last remaining wild, wild west of the five elements. Because everything else has some model of collective bargaining that they can look to. As composers, it really, we are uh, both more vulnerable and more powerful because we are still, in a sense, writing the rules as we go. And it's, it's, it's an issue. Uh, uh, is this on? OK. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, just related specifically to what you brought up, the, the comparison to the lighting designer. And that's a bit of an elephant in the room, like the favored nation clause, which my Eastern European upbringing is like, yes, we should all be paid the same for the distribution of wealth and all of that. But that comparison is always very challenging to me, especially if you're composing. The amount of time in rehearsal even, it's such a different comparison, but all the, that is always the comparison between the sound designer slash composer and lighting designer, somehow that should be an equal pay scale when really there's not a comparison. How do, especially in a favored, favored nation's clause, 
what is the, the that is a question for uh, I think for us how do we navigate that is well do you mean favored nations that you get favored nations as a composer and as a sound designer or are you saying that is in favored nation just situation person person to person. just a person um, I mean this the easiest thing to navigate right now is just sound designer it gets even more complicated if part of your responsibility is also composition which oftentimes is if I'm going to do, be doing composition that's an additional budget and then it becomes but it's a favored nation clause how can we be paying you more than the, uh, but even let's let's ignore the composition even though this is about composition like it's not the same time like there's tech plus rehearsal and all of that um, it's, um, so that's one. and then the second question talking about like the 30 30 seconds of music in the show if it's a high if you're if if the final product is a hybrid of some original composition, some found, some um, maybe even a hybrid of the two. So this piece has elements of both. Um, how do you navigate that? Well, how do you how do you propose one navigates that in um, both from a credited stand like credit standpoint, but also from negotiating the fee and all. That's hard. <clears throat> it's hard. It's often very difficult. Uh, and that's why you asked the question, uh, of course, is that, uh, I mean, we've done things where we've uh, taken the credit as uh, music designer, we've called ourselves on a couple of shows, uh, uh, or where we've just s said the composition is so minimal, we don't even want to call ourselves a composer on it because we are embarrassed almost. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, as this organization is, is been coming into fruition and the conversations we've all been having, <clears throat> I think we're leaning more towards err on the err on the side of, of you know getting credit, err on the side of, of getting the fee. Yeah. Now you're, you're that rubs me the wrong way, especially a lot of times. Sorry. Um, so often you were asking to get the credit information two months, three right. months in advance, and then come tech you realize that half of the the original content that you prepared got thrown out, and now you're remixing a bunch of stuff. But then here in the program, I'm taking credit for someone else's work. That rubs me the wrong way. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, but my, my other point is, you just don't know how much work you're going to do ahead of time. Well, one of the things that we, we've done for, forever, because it is to, is to say, we don't, we don't say sound design or composer. We say sound design and original music. And that's sort of a, you know, that at least says, at least for ourselves, if nothing else, we're only taking credit for that music which is original. Now, how many people actually pay attention to that? I don't know, but it's been important to us to do that because we don't want to do that. I mean, you know, we've been in situations where we've seen people who, uh, you know, 90% of a score and they want to, uh, okay, never mind. I uh, won't name names, but there was a guy who won a Jeff Award, and it was for this one moment that was clearly Jane's addiction and wasn't, wasn't him, you know what I mean? And uh, it was long enough ago, I think. I, 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 you know, I, 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 what, what, I, what I'll say is, is um, I do think it's two separate jobs. If, if it's not going to contractually be two different jobs, I see what room there is to negotiate what are the source of money there might be before I turn it down, you know, but, but and, and, and Fairly often, actually, there's another sound designer working with me. Certainly at Stratford, that was always the case, because it would have been gargantuan and way too much for me even to do, no matter how much money they gave me. The other thing I was going to say about credit is, um, because Brad mentioned he saw a Hamlet I did at a, at a small theater in Albany, where I actually said, you know, I did say original music, but I also put in the program, you know, much of the music was by Gustav Mahler, because I actually based the entire score on his nine symphonies in order. And, and that was my answer to, well, there's no budget here. So I'll just adapt Mahler and have a good time because it's kind of great. Um, and, but but I, I try to make it a habit if, if, unless there's a deadline in the budget of, of getting it into the program if I can. Mm. Because well, like, as I certainly don't want to say that I wrote that. And I, mean, I just went through an experience the reverse of, uh, it was just sound design. 
and the director said, it's just sound design, it's just sound design, until two weeks before tech, and then said, oh, I think, you know what, we're going to need music. And it was 23 scene transitions. So immediately I went to the, the production manager and I said, look, here's what's up. I said, we're gonna tr I'm going to try to do this without composing all of this, but here's what's up, and I need you to talk to my agent right now. And uh, I wasn't insisting. I was just saying, please have this conversation. Are you willing to do that? And he said, I'm willing to do that. That's great. If it gets to be to the point where it's not just one cue, but now all of a sudden it's really expanded and you're doing a lot of work, and guess what? The theater, the theater paid it. Because we had an upfront agreement and a, and a, and a mutual trust between us that it, it wasn't about me trying to just, you know, schmooze the deal. It was about, these, this is the work, now this is the gargantuan work we have to do. And uh, I think having those good relationships with those theaters, especially the regional theaters that we work with, um, you know, that's invaluable. I'm just going to jump in one for a second because I actually have a clause in my contract with my agent that if composition is required after this, this is signed, it renegotiates at this minimum and then negotiates according to how much work I have to do. And they, they sign off on it before so that when we get to that point, they already know that. So you can set up the relationship earlier. You can also ask for uh, program inserts, which I've done on occasion, right. and right. Uh, you can ask people to change lobby boards, because it, it, as you say, I mean, things change up to the final moment before the, the opening. And uh, you know, we're often caught in, in a case where suddenly our role has changed. So, but you, 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 know, you can't be afraid to ask for the proper credit and also to delineate what you've done and what other people have done. But one more thing, though. You also asked about the favored nations thing. And, and some of us have been talking about how, how, how deadly that can be uh, to us and how we're going to approach that in the future uh, is, is a really big question because uh, theaters not only use it to keep us down, but to keep everyone else down, and to keep wages down year after year after year doing this. Because it, it keeps going from one season into the next season into the next season. And there's a lot of theaters that we've worked at, and I'm sure you guys would agree, where we haven't gotten a raise in you know, 15, 20 years in some cases, where they're still paying the same fees because they keep saying, oh, favored nations, next season, oh, well, we can't do that because we just paid him that. And where, you know, how, how, do we get, how do we get ahead? Do we ever get a raise? Do we ever deserve a raise? I don't know. We also have the advantage of, you know, of we who can do both of having the double fee. Here, here in New York, it's perhaps the only way possible to make a living doing off-Broadway theater is to have the opportunity to have those two fees because the off-Broadway fees are so terrible. Um, but it's something that, yeah, I don't know how that gets addressed down the, down the line. All right, are you guys asking now, are you asking for two different jobs, two fees, but are you also asking for two separate contracts in some cases? Are you asking for Sometimes. two separate yeah, assistants uh, in I some cases? I think it's always. always. Am I, I always get two different contracts. And, and does your, how many of you have, have tried this without the use of an agent? Well, over the years, I mean, you know, way, way back in the day, we did it without an agent. Um, uh, it was hard. You know, I'm, I've been lucky enough to have an agent for, for a really long time, but the first few years in Storefront Theater in Chicago and working with, even working with Steppenwolf and the Goodman when I first started working there, that was a long time ago, but they, did, they didn't know what to make of us back then, they, seriously. Yeah, I would recommend not doing it without an agent. And if you don't have an agent, sometimes you, will, you can find somebody, you can call them up and say, hey, look, I'm not looking for you to represent me, but I need help with this one job. Can you just help me navigate this one gig? And, and, and you'll actually you'll find uh, some a, uh, agents that will do that. And I would recommend that. I, getting yourself involved in it, uh, it uh, would be something to try to avoid, probably. Yeah. Just to go back, uh, are you also asking for two different assistants in some cases? If you are doing two jobs, so do you have a sound design yes, assistant sir. and a composition assistant, or do you treat maybe your associate as doing more of the design and? your assistant being more of the composition? Usually the skill sets are so different, I find, that um, if, if the project requires that there be a, uh, 
let's say, say a, 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 a copyist to work along with me to help just deal with the parts for the recording sessions or something like that because I'm still trying to do the sound design, I'm still trying to compose it. You know, that's a very specific thing that I'm not going to ask my sound designer to associate to because he may never open Finale, nor do I expect him to open Finale uh, as a program. So um, I, I, I think that's absolutely fair game. And again, depending on the job and, 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 and the nature of the work. And, I'm, and, and sometimes you have to really, I find, push the theaters hard to understand why the uh, composer side you need to associate. But sometimes I find they, they, they understand a little more than need for a music director. Um, especially if you're not in residence the whole time, those where I'm not in residence most of the time. But I, these are, I, I feel like these are all valid, separate jobs that theaters continue need to, need to be educated about. Um, and it surprises me sometimes the large theaters that uh, seem as if they are not educated about it. Uh, so it's, it's a fight we keep fighting, you know, show by show. So what do you do when you need to be in residence? How do you negotiate that with the theater? Or teach them? How do you educate them? Sorry? When you need to be in residence. We've, uh, we've done it yeah. um, on certain plays where there's maybe 20 songs to write. And we've gone to the director and we've said, look, we know we, we all want to do this. Let's, can you go to the producing body and talk to them and see if we can get a weekly? And then we negotiate that based on some union scales that we have. 20 songs? Yeah. That's a musical. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fun. That's the fun one. It's yep. not a musical. It's not a musical. It's not. Yeah. You know, so. It's a music. It's a play with music. Yeah. That's right. So, so you know that that in itself, we knew we had to work with. Yes, it is. And we had to work with the lead actor and actress. And so it was special. So we asked for not only the composing fee and the sound design fee. We asked for music direction, and and that included being in the room. So our time in the room, which was I think substantial yeah. in the end. So you so appealed through the director. Yes, and and it was a hard-fought battle for her, but she was very good at trying to explain the need for that because you couldn't just throw these songs on a cassette, send them out to the actors, and have them listen to it, and learn the thing. And you know, it was a collaboration between the actors, their ranges, their you know, every like we do. And uh, it, it was necessary that we were there. So they they eventually understood it. I think one of the things that we, that, that we're very careful about and, and as, a, as a group need to be aware of is that it, when, we're, when we're writing music and we're doing sound design, that it, and I know this is tricky, but it doesn't appear like we're double dipping. That we're actually putting in the hours, we're actually putting in the work, we're putting in you know, the, the time and, and the effort where it really is two fees. If we, if we end up showing up, you know, the day before tech and, and throw it all in and, and, and leave, you know, leave it after the second preview, I think producers would feel much more hesitant about giving us two fees if we don't sp seem to spend any more time on it or even less time in some cases than a lighting designer does. You know what I mean? So uh, th that's on us to, as, as we develop our relationships with producers, and, and believe me, every relationship that every one of us has with a producer affects the next person that comes down the pipe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is, it, it, anyway, it's, it's, it's on us. We have a certain responsibility when, when we're asking for twice as much money as anyone else is getting. In a lot of cases, we deserve it, but we've we got to make sure that we're involved with that. That's all. Yeah, but you've got to remember that when the set designer does the costumes, they're getting two fees. Right. I mean, it, it's not... It, the idea that we're doing something extraordinarily unsavory, it, it's, just not, it's just not true. Right. And I'll often say that between composition and sound design, we're oftentimes the, the, the first man standing and the last man standing in terms of the design team. And that may, I mean, the, direct, the, the set designer's been building earlier, but in terms of rehearsal period. He's been designing earlier, either, but in terms of rehearsal period, uh, I feel like I'm, I, I tend to be there before any other designer, and most often I'm the last to leave, just because of the nature of how things change. And if there's live music in the show, if there's live singing in the show, right up until opening, you know, you're, you're changing, you need to be noting, and all that. And it's, I just try to build it in as early as possible. And given the wild uh, west of compositions of the theater that we were talking about, 
you have more leeway, I think, to do that uh, in, in, in this aspect than you might necessarily in the collective bargaining agreements. Good point. So we had said that you can work through the director. Are there any other ways to help educate these theaters about what it's like to be a composer in theater? Go take, you know, go have lunch with the managing director. You know, take them out. Or if I didn't take them. Or production managers. Production really, managers. really, you know, they, they need help. They're in a, they're in a tough position because they're the ones who have to work in the, in the budget. Okay. And as Michael said earlier, you know, sometimes we, yeah, we have to educate, but sometimes it's just, it's, it's one theater, one show at a time. We say, okay, you know, we really need this job, we really want this job, uh, but next time, can I get 25% more for this? Or you could ask for the double fee and they may go, that's out of the question. Well, let's say, okay, well, how about 25% more? And then the next gate may get up to 50 and then go beyond that. And you know, over the course of three or four years, suddenly you've got you've got a partner in what you're doing that understands what you're doing and and is supporting. Well, do you think a scenic designer would say, "Well, we've only got a one wall unit set, and therefore we're going to negotiate for a smaller fee for this show, whereas next time we'll put up the two side walls as well, and therefore we'll scale our fee appropriately." I mean, I find it a little concerning that for something that's basically the equivalent of salary, we're now talking about quantifying the hours to justify the fee. I and mean, it's about doing the job to serve the show more than it is about saying, I'm now making $20,000 instead of $10,000. So instead of putting in 60 hours worth of work, I need to put in 120 hours worth of work. I mean, that's a really, really, really good point. But it, it, sometimes, there's a, I mean, there's a reality in some of this. And, and one of the things that we want to do as an organization is, is change the culture, is change the culture of theater and how they look at the pie, because they got one pie. And, they, and most production managers and producers all look at it the same way. They got this much for costumes every show, they got this much for set, and they got this much for sound. And we got to get them thinking differently about that, that sound and music becomes this much. But it's going you know, it's to it's take time. Now, in some cases, I'm with Dan. I mean, Michael and I have said in certain, certain gigs, absolutely no way. We're not going to do it for anything less than two fees. But that also depends on the institution, and it depends where, you're, where you are in your career as well, and where the theater is in their development. Uh, the, the one thing I'll say across the board about it is theaters make assumptions about these budgets long before you've ever been approached. <laughs> most often, and I just try to get to the director for even, you know, four phrases to know about the show, and then I can go back to them as early as possible and say, guys, whatever you've assumed, here's what I know is going on, and I'm giving you, you know, a six month, or a four month heads up on it, or a two month heads up on it before first rehearsal. Start, let's start trying to work this out. So that I keep trying to uh, make it as less of a surprise as possible for them. My, my favorite most recently was that it was a play where the script begins, and I was hired as a composer, the script begins, a choir sings, and the first conversation I had with the general manager is, oh, well, you know, we're not hiring a choir. It's like, well, surely you've read the play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's kind of my first response to that. But it feels like- And usually they haven't, by the way. And they haven't, right. right. But it, it, it really, to me, is about trying to head as much of this off at the pass, which also means educating each other about you know, what are the things that can come up on your way to the past? I just think we have to be very careful about apologizing for doing our job. Yeah, well, that's, really? that's, that's really it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, True. you know, and, 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 and I, I guess what I would say, because I've been in on all these um, phone calls through the year, and uh, um, is it's, it's important for us not to apologize for our jobs, but it's in some ways, just to speak about this meeting, it's even more important for you guys not to apologize for the fact that you have two jobs. In other words, you know, in some ways, we, you know, we, I mean, I've fought some battles and done what I've done and sometimes given in and sometimes not, and life is what it is. And, but, and, and, and this profession has, has, or professions, has evolved to, uh, you know, and, and uh, the uh, Work Practices Committee has a list, 
you know, that's really long of all the jobs that are within the context of the work we do sometimes, sometimes all those jobs are there. So I think it's a question of if, if we're an information gathering organization that can help people navigate their way, you know, next year uh, to a better place, great. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's tricky. And, and, uh, and, and I'm in a position where, well, uh, fortunately, a fair amount of my job is music directing and doing a, a small uh, other things. I don't only do music and sound design for theater. I do lots of other myriad things, you know. Um, so I, I'm not in this conversation all the time. But Sam's known me to be in this conversation where, you know, at, at, at where I've, you know, had to say, guys, this is not right, you know, and we've got to figure something out. And, and I'm not, and, and you're right not, not to apologize for that. Yeah. And that also brings up another thing that I remember, I think it was John who had brought it up in one of our phone calls that it, at least you insisted on getting additional welfare and insurance as the second role if they weren't going to pay you the fee. And I know, Michael Roth, you have a big thing about insurance too because of AFM versus yeah. USA, but I thought I that could be something interesting. I, I don't know if that was me, but it's certainly important to get the, right. you know, the payment on. But the, the problem is that we don't that we don't get it on our compensation fee, right? Right. And that um, and that sometimes we get shorted in our P and W input because <clears throat> they, they'll pay us a minimum sound design fee and say we'll make it up with the you know some composer fee, but then we're getting paid a lot less into our P and W than the lighting designer, say right. on Broadway, for instance. Right. Well, and my, yeah. my my answer to that 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 happened over a handful of years. Um, is that I basically, the way my uh, local, local 47 in Los Angeles looks at my work in theater is that I do the music preparation for my work. That is to say, I take whatever fee I'm getting for everything and I divide that up into an AFM hourly rate and then I get benefits for that. Now the advantage has been for me that for any number of jobs, even somebody who used a score of mine for a little theater in Western Illinois, um, and it, an individual paid me, and I said, well, can you afford to pay some benefits on top of that? And she said, which it was not gonna be very much, she said, sure. So it's very easy to do that. They just have to sign the participation agreement. So, uh, so it's made getting benefits as a composer uh, and music director and musician and pianist an occasional somebody coming over, can you record a song with me for two hours? Yeah, pay me and can you pay benefits on top of that? Yes. It's, it's, it's made, now this is something I've, all, I've only been doing for about 10 or 12 years. It's not something I've been doing since I was you know, 30 because I, in fact, was very naive about a lot of this then and, and not, not very bright. I still, that may be the case now too, but, um, but in any case, that's something that, I, that is interesting for people because when because I do know that if you're the composer and there's another sound designer in a USA contract, there's no benefits for you. And that's could I? Could I? Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe this is out of the purview of what this panel is about, but it's sort of what we're all sort of circling around right now, talking about. I mean, Michael, what you've done is a very clever way of using the system to make sure you're getting your benefits as a composer. But what what interests me about this organization is. And one of the issues that is a problem for all of us as composers is that there is no representation for composers, period. Zero. There's no, we're not a part of USA, we're not a part of AFM, we're not a part of anything. Mm -hmm. And what I see this organization having a wonderful, terrific role in is to become some sort of guild, because we can't be a union because we create copyrightable material, some sort of guild for composers so that our work as composers can be protected, so that in some way uh, the Lord, uh, oh, the, what is the, union, the group that oversees Lord Theaters? So there's a negotiating body that represents composers with the Lord Theaters, so that we don't slip through the cracks so that we don't have to finagle, worry about, is it one contract or two contracts? I mean, that's where I see that an organization like this can have great value. 
where we really set up something that does not exist, which there is a great need for it to exist. So, I mean, I, I don't know if that's the purview of this panel, but that's, oh, I th I think but it that's is. one of the yeah. things that interests me about this group, right. is that as a composer, to create a guild that we get protection, that we have set minimums, that we have you know, pension and welfare paid. I mean, I don't know if the theaters are gonna buy it. I mean, it's something that we'll be, have to negotiate, and there will be enormous resistance to this. But I do believe it's an, of enormous value, and it's something that I think would mean a great deal to many of us in this room. I, I, I completely yeah. agree. And, and, and yeah, I mean, and you're, and you're right. I mean, that my, what I've done is my, uh, a solution that was essentially presented to me at a certain point because I wasn't going to get benefits. You know, right. I mean, I, no, I was. Well, well, you've done something clever. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but the uh, idea is right. taking it to the next point and let's, right. Right. let's not have to jury the system and let's be represented for what we are and for what we do. Right. Correctly. Right. You know, that, there, there, there are some jurisdictional issues because I think we got in trouble with with the dramatist guild with uh, early on. Where they, uh, what did they say? Well, they said that you know you, you guys are saying you represent composers or theater composers. But the dramatist guild says uh, they do too. And that they and that's what they do. But they represent music theater composers. So I, I'm not sure what those issues are or whether right. they you know. Well, and the dramatist guild uh, doesn't really negotiate for anyone. I mean, they're, they're powerful in, in that they have many numbers, but you're a recent, a very recent, very recent edge, member of yeah. it. But uh, there's no negotiation that goes on with them, uh, with anyone as far, as far as I know. And, you know, speaking, you know, and you're right, Dan, we can't, because of what we do, no one's going to let us become a union. I've spoken to Carl Mueller many times about this, and 829 will not take composers. And even if we tried to become a union on our own, we would never be recognized by the National Labor Relations but, Board. Uh, we'll see, but that's a big, I mean, that's the crux of it. That's what we have to discuss. We have to discuss, well, what is this organization going to be? And what is this function going to be? We're here because we are upset about the way certain things and the way they happen in the theater today. And, and, and I think one of the things that I admire about this group and I see as a, like a real shining thing about this group is that we can actually be a force of change so that we get the kind of production and the kind of recognition we, I believe we totally deserve. I have a question. Have you ever talked with Carl about the idea of the 829 representing music producers or music theater engineers or, you know, in the same way that AFM doesn't uh, in the same way that AFM doesn't cover the intellectual property, but covers all of the jobs peripheral to music creation, have you guys ever thought of a framework like that? I mean, uh, you know, not really, again, because it feels like it's sidestepping side side the issue. I mean, I it, again, it's, it's cl there's a cleverness that maybe is smart, that maybe should be pursued. But, uh, but just talking in the purest sense of what we do, I've written a piece of music. I want my job as a composer to this have the same kind of protections as I can now get as a sound designer. And it, it feels so odd to me sometimes that, totally. that the, the, the composing is belittled in comparison to the sound design. Right. But it's only because there's a framework for the producers mm -hmm. to understand what a sound designer is. And the com Poser side of it has no framework for them, and it's it's willful the ignorance. It's not sure. because they don't understand. It's about money, so it's a kind of a willful ignorance about well we don't understand. There, they there understand. There also are all these sort of turf issues with eight, with eight hundred two. Sure, and, uh, but yeah, there's no. Better. But in terms of a composer, there's no turf issue right, with eight hundred two. They they say well, we the, have nothing the, to do with composers. Well, I got oh, Carl to admit to me. Oh yeah, let's do this. <laughs> that composing incidental music had more in common with a design process than the uh, creation of, of uh, a score for a musical because uh, as I explained it to him, the work of a composer working for a director creating music that is an element of a production is beholden to the same sort of work rules of revision and collaboration and being on the clock, essentially, that uh, 
that affects the rest of the design departments as well. And I said, so for that reason, if I'm doing a score for Glass Menagerie, I'm not asking you to protect, I said, Carl, I'm not asking you to protect the melody itself. I'm asking you to protect the, the working, protect me from the working conditions in which I'm the only one in the room who's being offered a, you know, a third of what everyone else is getting. Uh, and he said, oh, I guess, yeah, if you're doing incidental music for the Glass Menagerie, that is the same thing as design. And he said he would take you on in that capacity? No, he just admitted it philosophically. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, I mean, it, it, on I mean, some level, it's a I question of inertia, right? Like, mm, yeah, I see. I, I mean, it's interesting that he said that to you, because whenever I've pushed the question to him, he always comes down, eh, nope, it's copyrighted material. There's no way we can't do it. You have to be a guild. That's been my experience of it, with, you know, with him as well. Who's a great, you know, who's a great we love champion. Carl. Don't get us. Love Carl. There are others who have tried to organize a union for composers, and it has not succeeded. So it's, in the it's theater a, or in no, other, in other in general, film in, and in, yeah. Oh, so. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, b b b b because I know that a lot of the benefits that film composers get, um, I I if especially if they're conducting or supervising the production of their score, that that's an AFM job, and that that's how they get their benefits. But they're not getting it as composers. Um, I, you know, I I don't want to say that purely because I don't actually don't really know because because it, it it's there's other stuff going on there that I, I'm only privy to some of that, but I know that. Um, when Randy conducts for Disney, he's making a lot of money, sure. you know, and, and he's getting benefits on all of it. Precisely. I mean, in the in the theater, if if our only deliverable were a score on paper, that would be it. One situation, which would would have its own issues, but I think we are also responsible for delivering a finished recorded product. Right. right. And I, I think there are some distinctions to be made there that might help us not yeah. give up completely. Right. Right on, man. That sounds great. So we'll get after them, seriously. And I, th and I think you're right, Dan. I think this is an organization that even if we can't literally become a union because of jurisdictional reasons and legal reasons, we can certainly become a voice. And the more people that we have and the more numbers that we have, and if we're smart about how we put pressure and where we put it, you know, we can make, it, we can make a difference. Whether we're gonna get in an actual negotiation with Lord sitting across the table, uh, pretty unlikely for a while, but we can keep pushing in that direction. Why not? I have a question for you guys. You know, Mike was just talking about um, the, the AFMM contracts that he. Um, Mike was talking about the AFMM contracts that he files. You know, I guess the hard thing really is having a negotiating um, uh, structure. And I think you guys got screwed in the early 20th century yeah. when <laughs> Irving Berlin decided that you know. <laughs> theater, theater was a way for people to get songs heard so they could then put them on 78s and totally, them, um, totally that's paper, what, what, what it was about. And they were making all their money off of right. selling sheet music and selling 78s. Right. Every Lynn made his fortune not off of the theater but off of all their ancillary rights. Um, you guys don't, don't have that. It's like, it's a, it's a, every time you do it, it's pretty much a one-off when you're doing music for a play. The, 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 the one thing I'll, I'll, I'll just say to that, because John, you actually asked me about this too, is that Again, this is just very fortunate, but, but some of the stuff I've done has been filmed, and uh, especially in Canada. And um, A, I own all the music. Um, now, the performances in the music is all AFM controlled, so, there's, so when a film is made, that's a renegotiation that happens and is taken care of. Assuming that that happens, so let's just put that, that there, then, um, then you know, once it's broadcast, I get ASCAP royalties. Now, I just want, this is anecdotal, but I, I know I mentioned it to some of you, but um, I got, I've gotten to know Paul Williams a bit, who's the president of ASCAP, so he's my president. And it was great to meet him, and he is 72, 73, he's about 5'1", and he's a feisty bastard about rights of composers and publishers. And his biggest thing now, given the way revenue happens or doesn't happen in music uh, because of how much is online and how complicated that world is, is that he is fighting for making sure that the residuals still come to composers and publishers. And right when I heard him talking about that, I actually got a royalty check from uh, streaming of, of The Tempest in Amazon Prime. 
which when we go, wow, I mean, like that's that's really kind of new, and it's just it's it's just so I mean, a I guess what I'm saying is make sure you own your music <laughs> because you never know when it might get broadcast. You know, everybody at the level of pay that we're all working at, if anybody doesn't. If any theater organization says that they own the rights to your music, you should not do the job. Yeah, and and own your publishing too. It's it's, it's both. Well, this is this is an area actually where I, I found as a theater composer I have a lot more control of my music, and then right. now, now that I'm doing film and TV, it's sort of customary that if like if you're doing work for you know, a television show that you give up all the rights for your music. Right. So I, I found I'm able to dictate the terms more right. for my theater work. Right. Um, but on the film and TV work, it, it, it's not. The yeah, I mean, it, 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 uh, uh, yeah, it's all it all because they're paying more usually or ostensibly. But there's been a long-term struggle with that too, right? I know right. My, my old studio partner who composed a lot of music for National Geographic Explorer in the 1980s and 90s, and when National Geographic was bought by I forget who they were bought by, they they said no longer can the composers control the rights to their music. And he went through a really big fight with them about that. And it was a big thing for him because National Geographic stuff had the licensing agreements where he got money in the, uh, in the mail four times a year for all those shows. And all of a sudden, in like the late 90s, they said, no more. And there was a big fight in the composer's world. All the composers have been writing music and keeping their rights. All of a sudden, sorry guys. Right, so right. it's a struggle, not just <laughs> in this yeah. world, I think, but in broadcast and media as well. Right. Yeah, I had a case recently where I, you know, I wrote a score for, for a theater piece that then was turned into a film, and the film was broadcast on a network, and the network said, well, you've got you to hand over all your rights to all that music. And I said, no, no, I have, I'm not going to, you know, I, I, so I maintained the, the rights for the theatrical release, and uh, it's an issue. But, the, but yeah, so, so back to the, qu the question that I have about, is there a way to use AF of M uh, as a, a structure to, to for, for some of this? No. Probably not. I mean, I've, I've found a way to, to work for me that covers everything I do. And, and look, I need benefits. I, I do need these things. Um, and, but, but the whole, is a composer a job in the AFM, is, is, you know, or USA or whatever, it's, uh, that, that's something that obviously is a rather passionate discussion. But I know it's like gaming the system, but a lot yeah. of people... No, but that's like, great. No, I mean, yeah. there are ways... But AF, AFM will not deal with copyright issues. Right. No, I'm just talking about the actual getting P&W and things like that. But, 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 but what Michael I'm, does I'm is the way to do it. it. Yeah, that, 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 that's the way I, that I do it. And as I say, the biggest advantage for me is that it covers everything I do. And, and, and if I actually do... Um, that's them now. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not what you're going to do anymore. Um, I'm going to let that ring. It's a good sound cue, isn't it? Um, anyway, good. Uh, um, it's. Um, <laughs> it made me lose my train of um, No, no it, 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 and when I do have a legitimate you know, music director gig, you know, that's a, an AFM contract, then that falls into that. When I have an orchestration thing that's legitimate or. You know that that then, it but it just manages to cover everything I do in a way that doesn't involve a lot of bureaucracy or minimum you know minimum fees or whatever it's whatever I've negotiated or somebody else has negotiated for me can fit into a system and frankly it's it's look it's taking care of my team you know. I sadly, sadly have to cut this short. We are over time right now. But um, obviously, there's a lot to discuss here, and there were still hands up. So please take this break in between and talk to anybody while we're getting our food and whatever, and continue the conversation, please. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.
So okay, well, I'll get up before you go. One last time, embrace the city. And by the way, if we are all Canadian or all in Denmark, so much of this conversation would actually kind of put them away a little bit. Is there protection for composers? No, all I mean is that, for example, healthcare.